Well, welcome, Family Church. We are in the middle of a sermon series called Hall of Faith, where we are looking at these characters from the Old Testament, from Hebrews chapter 11, and all of the ways that they fell in love with God and followed with faith. We had an interesting thing happen that we did not intend. And if, if you ever hear a pastor say, yeah, we meant to do that, we're probably joking, because here's what happened. We were looking at the end of the book of Ephesians, and in it we were looking at the armor of God, and there was one specific piece of the armor called the shield of faith. And we didn't realize it, but we were talking about this shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one right before we went into a, uh, a sermon series about faith. And every time we look at a character, here's what I'm finding. The way that they used faith, it was almost like that there was a new way that they were wielding their shield. They were, learn they were teaching us a new way to do it. And today we're going to look at one of those characters. We're going to look at the character of Abraham and how did he use that. So as we look at this book, um, this is where we'll be. So I was thinking about, my, uh, about 20 years ago, my uh, grandmother had moved to Vancouver and I was going to go visit her. And she lived in an apartment building that I had never been to. So I got directions from my father and drove three hours. I crossed over the river took the exit I was supposed to, and then got utterly lost. The directions I had said to turn on this road, it turns out there's multiple roads with that name. One of them's a court, one of them's a drive. I didn't know where I was. And I don't know if you can tell by my voice, but the longer I went without proper information, the more upset I got. I don't know how you are if you've ever lacked information. I know some of you are thinking right now, hello, pull out your phone. Let me remind you, I said this was 20 years ago. There was no phone to pull out and just look at the GPS and say, oh, this lady's going to tell me, turn right in 1,000 feet. There was no one telling me that. The only directions I had were from two people. One of them, my dad said, here's how to get there. The other one is I had this a song stuck in my head, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. I crossed the river. There were no woods, okay? And the horse didn't know anyway. I didn't even have a horse. I was on a Nissan, okay? I had no idea how to get there. And now I have Jingle Bell stuck in my head. Because here's what I know. When you have low information, you often get a rise in your emotions. And for me, I got upset. For some people, they get scared. They start sweating. They have to turn the radio off. I was listening to someone. They were telling me that when they get nervous because they lack information and they get lost, here's what they do. They turn the radio off because they can't hear and see simultaneously when the emotions are up. How important is information to us? The character we're going to look at, the character of Abraham, He's going to go through a process in his life where he has very little information. Give you a quick little background. We have really two characters today. We have Abraham and his wife, Sarah. But each of them had a different name at a different time. So Abraham at one point would be Abram, and his wife, Sarah, at one point was Sarai. So as we're reading through the text today, you may see some uh, differences there. But as we pick this up, I want you to notice something. That we're going to look for an eternal promise because this guy, Abraham... It's an interaction with God, and God calls him into a story bigger than himself. He calls him into an eternal story, and in that, he gets a promise in it. So as we're looking through this, we're in Hebrews chapter 11, but these characters were also from the Old Testament. So a lot of our time today, we're going to actually be in the book of Genesis. And so I know that uh, you were told to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. So why don't you go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 12, okay? Because we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12 to start. So here's where we are. This is the first interaction that God has with Abraham, or the first recorded one. They may have been talking before this, but this is where we pick it up. This is what it says. The Lord said to Abram, that's Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I don't know if you caught this. I will show you, meaning I'm not going to give you a lot of information right now. And then he gives them this great promise. Look at this. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and I will be a you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I, whoever curses you, I will curse. And then here is this beautiful moment, this eternal principle, this eternal promise. Right here he says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All. You know who includes that, is included in that? Me. You know who else? You. All peoples, which means Sutherland 2,000 years later, South Umpqua 2,000 years later, Roseburg, Green, Winston, all of the world, Africa, Asia, Europe, through all time, will be blessed through this guy. This is an eternal promise headed towards something amazing. But I don't know if you caught it early on. He said, I want you to leave the place that you are, leave your father, leave your mother, leave your household, leave what you know, and go. And here's your instructions. 
just go. Where? I'm going to show you later, which means he doesn't know the direction to go, which means his information is very low, which I think sometimes can raise the negative emotions in this. It is interesting, though. He's not given very many details about how to get there, where to go. In fact, real quickly, wherever you are, raise your hand if you're the type of person that loves the list, wants the details, wants it all. Raise your, you, so I get it. Some of you people are that way. Others are spontaneous. They're like, whatever, hey, let's just come up with something as we go. For those of you who are list people, this is one of the scariest stories in the Bible. Just get up and go, and I'll show you later. So Abraham doesn't get a lot of details about the middle of the story, but look at this. He gets a bit, the best detail about the end of the story, that out of this, all people will be blessed through you. So as we walk through this, I want to come back to something that Paul said in week one. He started talking about the idea that if we're going to have faith, it's built on two principles. It's on trust and obedience. Trust and obey. And I want to talk about when it's most difficult to trust. I think that this is a, a, an actual principle for you that, that might be um, critical for you to pull from this. Abraham did not have all the information. Abraham had hardly any information. And what I would challenge you is there are going to be moments in your life where the shield of faith that you have to hold up is you're going to hold it up trusting God even though you don't know what's next. You don't know what he's calling you to. All you know is that he's given you a piece of information and you have to hold on to that and you hold that shield up because I guarantee you this, that if God is calling you in a direction, there will be a flaming arrow coming from the enemy that you will need to extinguish. And remember that principle. It's not the hole the arrow creates, it's the fire it ignites. When it starts working through your mind, it starts working through your heart. How do you hold that shield up and extinguish the flaming arrow? When you get this, this, into this place where God calls you into something, but doesn't give you the information that you think you need. Notice this too. This is coming from Hebrews 11.8. He speaks directly to this. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So how do we move from this? Part of the trust is to say, I trust the person speaking more than I trust the details that I have. I don't have enough details. No, no, no. But I'm going to go in the direction he called me to because he's spoken, I've heard, and I will then, as we see right here, he obeyed. The eternal promise is given. Now the question is, will he trust and will he obey? You realize this is an option for Abraham. He can say, no. Obedience is always a choice. Whether or not he's going to say, I'll, I'll join in. So in, in verse 1, God calls him and says, I want you to leave. Verse 2, he says, you're going to be blessed. Verse 3 says, you're going to be a blessing to all generations. And then in verse 4, it says, and he did as he was told. He could have said, you know, no thank you. Can you imagine God sitting in heaven going, oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? Abraham said no. He's got to get the Holy Spirit and Jesus together. Quick huddle, get all the angels in here. Okay, what are we going to do? Our whole plan's messed up. Well, no, it wasn't. Because God plan, God's plan doesn't rest on Abraham. It doesn't rest on you. He's got an eternal plan. He had Jesus coming. Whether or not Abraham was going to be a part of it, that's the question. And it's the same question that comes around for you. When God calls, do you trust him, the speaker, and then do you obey? When he calls you to forgive, do you obey? When he calls you to go, do you obey? His story is moving forward. Whether or not we get in line with it is totally the choice that's before us, and it's the same choice that was before Abraham all those years ago. You know, I was thinking about the difficulty in, in falling in and saying, I'm going to go with the direction God calls me to, that I'm going to trust, and then I'm going to obey. I think one of them is when you have a low amount of information, but I think there's another component. I think it also gets really difficult um, when you have to wait a lot longer than you thought. I think one of the worst arrows that we get is an arrow of impatience, where the arrow comes and it says, you should have had it by now. Can you really trust God? Look how long you've had to wait. Remember those three words that Paul challenged us with at the beginning of our living series. Gentleness, humility, and patience. The idea of patience, and we've talked about this before, that patience quite simply means these two words, long 
suffering, that sometimes the waiting is exactly where we learn to trust God the most. And I want to tell you a little bit more about this Abraham story. So imagine what it feels like in chapter 12. You get three verses where he says, you are about to live the most amazing life. And in verse four, he says, I trust, I obey, I'm in, let's go. Well, what you might not have known is Abraham was 75 years old at that moment. And as a 75-year-old man, uh, he had no children. You can't, and I'm, this may be obvious, but let's walk this through with you. You can't be a great nation if it, when you die, you have left nothing behind. Nothing follows you. He has to have an offspring, and Abraham has none. Which means this promise that God has called him to, that he's calling him into, that he's saying, trust me and obey, he's got to have a kid. And I want you to imagine that your promise, essentially one of those promises, is that you're going to have a child. Well, let me just basic framework of how that works. You and your spouse get together, and then nine months later, you have a kid. So there is a waiting. It's called pregnancy, and it's, it takes about nine months, right? So Abraham gets this promise. He gets those three verses. In verse four, he uh, says, I'm in, and he leaves, and he goes, just as God had told him. And then he and his wife, well, nine months later, guess what they don't have? They don't have a kid. And a year later, they don't have a kid. Three years later, there's no kid. Five years later, there's no kid. Ten years later, there's no kid. That's a long time to wait. So now Abraham's 85. His wife is 75. What are we going to do? Here's the problem. When an arrow of impatience comes and we do not use a shield of faith, we will often look for a shortcut. And Abraham's wife, Sarah, looked for a shortcut. And this is in chapter 16 of Genesis. Oh, man, the consequences of these are so devastating. Look what it says here. So she, Sarah, said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, see with, uh, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. And in the course of time, Abraham went with a slave girl. And a year later, at age 86, Abraham had a son named Ishmael. Here's the sad thing. That son actually became a problem for the promise of God and became a conflict down the road. You see, Abraham heard a promise and thought, you know what, I'll just take matters into my own hands. This is what we call the shortcut, where you take, we take an easier road, where you see, I can't wait any longer. I've got limited information, and now I've been waiting. And an arrow comes in that says, ah, you should have had it by now. And then the fire festers. And, and so you say, I'll take matters into my own hands. Sadly, God had a plan, but God's plan was with a bigger miracle than this. In fact, what God's plan was is that he was going to bring a son to Abraham and Sarah, but it was going to be not 10 years later, but 25 years later. In fact, Sarah was, was looking for a way to circumvent it. She wanted to skip the miracle, but the miracle was going to be a 25-year wait and then a 100-year-old man with a 90-year-old woman giving birth to a son. What a miracle! But Sarah said, you know what? It's been 10 long years. Let's try a shortcut. And here's what I've noticed. When you look for shortcut answers, you get long-term consequences. There was relational problems between Sarah and Abram. There was relational problems between Sarah and the maidservant that she handed over. There were problems between the son that comes 25 years after the promise and this son. In fact, Ishmael is the, the descendants of Ishmael become the Arabs, which are in conflict with the descendants of Isaac, the son that comes later, and Israel. There are consequences from this shortcut that are still being lived out today. I was talking with Pastor Jason, and he was telling me that, oh, he's like, I was telling him about the shortcut. He's like, oh, man, I have lived that out. When uh, he and Shaughnessy were first married, they were, uh, she was in the National Guard, and right when they got married, she was to be deployed and they were worried about this. What are we going to do? We just got married. We, she did not want to be deployed into the Middle East, and this is scary, and what are they going to do? And so they requested a transfer, and they were denied. So they requested to get out of it, and they were denied. So they had a plan. They had a plan. They would cross the state line and move somewhere else and request a transfer into a unit that was not going to be deployed. They moved all the way to Spokane, Washington, and then requested a transfer and they were denied. And so here they are. Now they've moved across state lines. Now they're on the other side of the state of Washington. They're away from their families. They're away from everything they know. They're away from their community. Now they're on their own over in Spokane. 
And finally, they said, there's no option. We're just going to have to submit. And so Jason and Shaughnessy tearfully said, we have no other option. Okay, I guess Shaughnessy will go. They finally submitted to what the authority said. And here's what's really interesting about it. They tried to take a shortcut, and all along, God had a different plan. Right after they were willing to submit, Shaughnessy got pregnant. And with her being pregnant, she didn't have to go. But you know where they found themselves? In Spokane, Washington, on the other side of another state, great distance from their family. They were living out with some consequences. They had to live there, end up living there for two years, distant from family, because they attempted to take a shortcut instead of walking in what God had. Because the arrow of impatience lit a fire in them, and instead of having the shield of faith risen up to say, no, 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 I, we trust the one who's called us. We're going to do what he calls us to. Here's a quick reminder. When you look at the story, when God gave a promise to Abraham, he came in saying, I will. I will do this. I will make you. Over and over and over again, God says, I will. I will. I will. I want to show you again what Sarah says. I can. You see how the story has changed? You see how the author of the story? Sarah's trying to take the pen and the paper from the, from the author of the story and say, I- I'll write this story. We've waited 10 years. That's enough. And then so she tries to write the story. And she, this is not a choose-your-own-adventure story. It's not how this works. This is about submitting to what God has called you to. And I want you to know something. Sarah was not the central figure in this story. But neither was Abraham. The central figure in this story is God. And I know that you, we think of it in this, these terms is that we're in the center of our stories. We are the only people in every scene in our movie. But I want you to know something. You're not living your story. You're living God's story. And I would actually say that where most of your life goes awry is when you move off of trusting God with writing your story and you start writing your own. My grandmother used to say, never question in the dark what God said in the light. Never question what he spoke to you in that moment where you were lucid and you heard him where 10 years earlier God spoke to him. Don't question when it gets dark. And I'll tell you, you know what feels dark when you have to wait a long time? And I know it's tempting But when we choose shortcut answers, it leads to long-term consequences. You know the beauty of the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace that God gives us? Though we have to pay for our consequences, it doesn't necessarily eliminate us. The God in his faithfulness continues on. And in the course of time, 15 years after Ishmael, God gave Abraham and Sarah a son. It was a beautiful moment. In fact, His son's name is Isaac, which means laughter because there were moments where both Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed when they heard the news that in a year you're going to have a child. And so they called him laughter. You can imagine the joy. I don't know what it's been like for you if you've become a parent, but how much your life changes and how much your perspective on the world changes when you see that you are no longer, your identity changes because I am no longer just Will. I am the father of someone. I am the mother of someone. That changes everything. Well, 12 years after, approximately 12 years after Abraham had um, finally been given the fulfillment of part of the promise in receiving Isaac, he is given a challenge and given a test. This is a different test than um, one that has few details. This one has quite a few details. In fact, some details I don't think he wanted to hear. Pick it up. This is in actually um, Genesis chapter 22. This is what it says. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Let's just pause there for a second. That moment when God says, hey, I want to check something in your heart. I've noticed this, that almost every time God tests us, it's not testing our physical ability. It's testing what our relationship to him is, and that's exactly where he is. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. What? Wait a second, what? I was 75 years old. You you called me. and And I went and I obeyed. And then after 25 years, you gave me a son. And now 10 or 12 years later, you're you're calling me to take him up a mountain and give him back. What do I do do with that? And it says in verse 3 that the very next morning, Isaac got up, or 
Abraham got up, and he did as he was told. And he got Isaac ready, and they headed off, and they headed up the mountain. The two of them with some servants, and as they're walking up, there's an interesting conversation that happens between Isaac and Abraham. Imagine what's going on in Abraham's heart. I love a couple things about this, that immediately he got up. The next morning he got up. He did not wait and delay. He was given instructions, and he said, what you call me to, I'll do. And so he and his son set out. And as they're walking along, though, this, this moment where Abraham is just wrestling with this, Isaac actually says to him, hey, dad, uh, we got the knife, we got the fire, and we got the wood. But we don't have a ram or uh, anything to sacrifice. Dad, where's the sacrifice? <laughs> oh, what does the dad say in that moment? And I think it might have been the Holy Spirit saying it through him, but he says, to his little boy, God will provide the lamb. So they get to the base of the mountain. They leave the, um, the servants there, and the two of them head on up the mountain. And as they get there, Abraham, in full obedience to God, ties up Isaac's hands, ties up, ties up his feet, puts him on the altar, and pulls out the knife to honor what God has called him to. And as he goes to do it, an angel says, Stop! Now I know that you value me more than you value him. Because here was the ultimate test, and maybe this is the ultimate test, is when you choose to value the giver more than the gift. What matters more, God or the gift that God gave in Isaac? This is an important test. In fact, I would say that one of the, the ways that God challenges us in our relationships with each other is the, in the way that we look at and perceive our entire world is what do you value? Do you value me, meaning God, more than you value anything else? And he says, stop, I know now that you value me more than you value anything else. Interesting, uh, this is what it says in verses 17 through 19 in Hebrews. This is the, basically, the author of Hebrews is comment, doing a commentary on what we see in Genesis. And look at how he describes this. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. He had embraced the promises. He had gone. He had done. He had finally received part of the promise. But now he was willing to, to lay him down. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be, uh, will be reckoned. And stop and think about this. You're going to be a great nation. Through whom? Through Isaac. Now take Isaac and kill him. They don't reconcile there. This is the perfect moment for an arrow to be shot at Abraham. I don't know what arrow may have come, but I know that the shield of faith was up and it was strong and it trusted that God said, this is true. He may have called me this, but something's going to happen. And he actually, uh, the author of Hebrews reveals what was going on in Abraham's heart. This is what it says. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. How great is this? Abraham is believing this before he knows the story of Jesus. But he knows the power of God. The, the God who created the world, the God who got a 90-year-old woman pregnant by a 100-year-old man, he's got some power and he can raise the dead. And I will trust in that power even if I don't understand the equation that says, through Isaac, you're going to be made great. Kill Isaac. I will trust that the same one who said this has the power to overcome that. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive back Isaac from the dead. As I look at this, it, it reminds me there's a song that, uh, that tells the story. It's probably 15, 20 years old. The interesting thing about it is how your perspective can change over time. The last line walks through this, this heartbeat as Abraham is wrestling with this idea of what do I really value. This is the last verse on it. It says, So take me to the mountain. I will follow where you lead. And there I'll lay the body of the boy you gave to me. And even though you take him, still I ever will obey. But maker of this mountain, please make another way. When I first heard that song, it was moving to me as I heard about the story of Abraham headed in a direction, being called to lay down his son. And I, what I loved about it was a story of obedience. But that song changed for me about 11 years ago. That's when I became a father. And I think you understand the perspective of some of our Bible characters when your perspective on the world changes. What would it be like for me to take one of my children and have to walk that path? But I do know God is asking me a similar question. Do I value my kids more than I value him? Do I value my spouse more than I value him? 
Do I value my cars? Do I value the house? Do I value my job? Do I, is there anything in my life that I value more than him? It's a beautiful part of this story. This idea of raising from the dead, this idea of Isaac being sacrificed, it's really a picture of Jesus, that Abraham was willing to lay his son's life down for what God was calling him to. And in the same way, God was no different. In fact, he offered his son only in a difference. The, the only difference is that when Isaac was laying on the altar, God said, stop. When Jesus was brought to the cross, God didn't say stop. And we are all so eternally grateful because the essence of the story is that we are sinners and we are separated from a holy God because sin can't reside with holiness. But to make up for this, God says, I will give you a sacrifice that pays the price. And so he sends his son to earth and his son lives for 33 years without sin. Unlike us, he lives without sin, and then he is put on a cross, and he pays the price for us. And like what Abraham believed could have happened for Isaac, God does in Jesus Christ. And three days later on Easter morning, Jesus Christ raises from the dead and changes everything about our relationship with God, and out of that, our relationship with everyone else. Because now we have the opportunity to have a connection with him. About eight or nine years ago, I was doing a sermon on this story. And at the end of it, I was talking with a pastor friend who came for the Saturday night service because we were just friends and he was being supportive. And he heard the sermon and he said, oh, that was good. You know, it was sad. And it, but he said this. He said, it was sad to me that when you talked about Isaac being laid on the altar, you didn't connect that with Jesus because you missed the real heart of the story. And I think that that's a real truth because when Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, so much of this is an opportunity for us to point back to Jesus Christ and remember this, that God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us so that we could have relationship with him. And because we have relationship with him, he's given us a shield of faith so that when the flaming arrows come, we have the opportunity to say, I don't care if I don't have enough information, I still trust God and hold that shield up. And when we have to wait longer than we think is necessary, we hold that shield up and we say, I trust him. You know, I was talking about not having enough information at the beginning when I was trying to get to Grandma's house. Boy, doesn't that feel like how life has been for us over the last three and a half months? This is how it felt for me. When we got to March and everything shut down, it felt like every week there was something new and everything was transitioning through April and it was constant change upon change and we never really knew what was happening or where we were going. And in some ways it felt to me, this is probably my perspective of it, but during May and June, Life kind of settled down, but here we are starting to open back up, and we're going to open our campuses back up on the 12th, and we're so excited about it. We've been moving that direction, and as we get going, then we find out everyone's wearing masks again, and it feels like we're back in that shifting, taking this way, then taking that way, and, and it feels like we don't have the information that we want, and what I've noticed is that when we come into a place where it's hard to trust God, and it's hard to obey God, we end up taking it out on each other. And I want to come back to something we've said for the last few weeks, that there is a tension in our communities, there's a tension in our homes, there's a tension in our churches, and God is calling us to peace. He's calling us to live gentle and humble and patient lives. And it's amazing how much more peaceful we are when we are gentle and humble and patient. I'm going to pray for us, and as I do that, um, we're going to have, share a, a quick announcement with you, and then we have a challenge for you in your groups that we want you to answer some questions. Let me pray for us. God, we're at a stage where we feel like we're in the middle of where you have called us to a promise, but for a lot of us, we feel like we don't know where we're going, and we don't know what's happening, and we feel like we're lacking information, and we feel like we're just constantly waiting, and it's frustrating. And God, we're frustrated. I'm frustrated. I know people that are listening are frustrated, but we hold up our shield of faith, and we trust you because we know who you are. And though we don't understand the times, we understand you and we trust you and we pray that you would help us to hold up our shield of faith. Lord, I pray for those temptations that we have to take it out on each other because we're frustrated and the emotions are higher because we lack information. And we feel like we've been waiting. We're in a waiting room of a world and we're tempted to slap at each other. And I pray that you would help us to have peaceful hearts, settle our hearts, that we would hear from you, that we would be gentle with each other, that we would be humble to hear from each other, and that we would be patient, that we would be loving, that we would be caring. God, I pray that you would grow our faith in this time. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray.